I'm glad you're here. If you're joining us online, we're glad you're here. It's your first time. Yeah, we appreciate you stepping out. Well, as Lindsay mentioned, we have the opportunity to hear from Bill Kohler. So Hope and I met Bill and Missy in 2004. Uh, we had heard this couple had moved to town who worked with Crew, which we had done with for 15 years before being pastors, and um, met them, and they joined kind of the initial wave at North Point. They helped us start the church. Uh, Missy served in all kinds of places, children's ministry. I think they led the first North Point small group. Um, Bill served as an elder. Well, one of the things Bill did in those years was um, he would critique my sermon, so I'd send him something, he'd give me thoughts. And uh, so when they moved in 2012, I said, Bill, would you continue to do this? He said, sure. And I don't think he's missed a sermon in the last 11 years. So most Sundays, you are hearing from Bill indirectly through me. Um, there's a lot of character qualities I love about Bill, but one that I will highlight is he's very kind. So if, if the closing isn't good, rather than saying, Andy, that's awful, he'll say, well, that's good as it stands, but it's not very compelling. Maybe you could find another closing. That's his way of saying, get rid of it. So I highly recommend, I heard the message first service. I think you can enjoy his picture of Jesus. So let's welcome Bill up. Thank you, Andy, and thank you, all of you. It's so great to be with you guys. So happy to be with you all. Um, yeah, I just want to start before we dive into God's Word together just by saying how grateful Missy and I are and really our whole family to be a part of your family. As Andy mentioned, just being able to be a part of North Point since the very beginning and even after we moved away from Lincoln in 2012 to continue to be a part of North Point uh, as, as partners in ministry as we serve a crew and helping young people to have an opportunity to, to know and follow Jesus around the country and around the world. Uh, we're so grateful that we get to do that with, with you guys. So uh, just really excited to be able to share God's word with you all this morning. Well, when I was in middle school, I was on the edge of the cool crowd. So you can only imagine how excited I was to get an invitation to one of their parties. And I remember this particular, I, only want, I think this is the only party I got invited to, so I'll just, it's not like I've been to, to several of them, but one party. And I remember showing up at the house, going down into the basement, and quickly realizing that this was a makeout party. And what I mean by that is that the whole purpose of the evening was that the boys paired up with their girlfriends and embarked upon an evening of cuddling and kissing together. Now, as, as a parent who has had four middle schoolers over the years, I don't recommend that we try this at home, kids, uh, but I'm just telling you about my experience back when I was a middle schooler. Um, so anyway, everybody paired up except for Janine Miller and yours truly. We were not dating each other, and so I, I, but I figured that the polite thing to do was to invite Janine to make out, so I did that, and she... <laughs> She was not interested in, in, in that activity. And so that left me as the DJ for the evening. And so I played one song. It was called Babe by Styx over and over and over again that night. And, and it just makes me think, you know, thinking back to that time, it, it just makes me think, I, I, I believe that we all hate to be outsiders. We long to be insiders because God has given us this core need for belonging. I mean, think back to your middle school days, your high school days, and how important it was to sit at the right table with the right group of friends. I, I mean, I think this is the reason that marketers give us things like Amazon Prime and Walmart Plus. You know, it's not enough just to be a regular Amazon customer, a regular Walmart customer. We, we need to have that inside access, that that special privilege, that, that inner circle to be a part of. And consider your own life this morning. Perhaps there are ways that you feel like an outsider. Maybe it's uh, on your job in terms of just the way that you relate to your employer or your, your fellow colleagues in your, in your work. Or it might be your friend group or the people that you wish would be a part of your friend group or maybe you feel some of that outsider status. Or it might even be your own family where you feel like you're, you're on the outside in that way. 
Well, whatever it is, I think it raises an important question, and that is, if we feel like we're on the outside, is there any hope of becoming on the inside? And that's the question I want us to explore this morning. We're going to look at the story of an individual who knew what it was like to be on the outside, and yet something happened that made him an insider. It's the same kind of thing that can happen with us. And so if you have a Bible or if you have access to one, why don't you go ahead and meet me in 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. And as we get started, we see that the first word in the first verse is then, which indicates that something had happened right before this story that we're about to look at. And what had happened right before this was that you know, the, the date here is about a thousand years before the time of Jesus, and King David has, has unified the ancient nation of Israel, and he has achieved a key number of, of military victories over the surrounding nations, and so now all of a sudden he's this, this, new, this new king with this newly minted power. Uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, said that if you want to know a man's character, See what he does with power. Well, we're about to find out what this king, this, this newly minted king, does with his power. Let's read the rest of first, verse 1 here. It says, David said, Is there yet anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, that is an interesting question, especially when we look at it in the sweep of history as a whole. Because you see, most incoming kings or rulers would ask a different question. They would ask, is there anyone left of the previous regime that I may eliminate them? That's what happened on August 16th, 1918. The communists had just swept into power in Russia, and Tsar Nicholas had been the ruler up until that time, and he was under house arrest. And that evening, he and his wife and his five children and their four servants were ushered down into the basement of the home in which they were staying, uh, supposedly for a family picture. They lined up in two rows when suddenly a dozen gunmen burst into the room and murdered all of them. Now, sadly, that is, that is not an uncommon thing when we look over the, the centuries, over the annals of history. That happens over and over again. And so the fact that David is wanting to show kindness is really remarkable. There's one other thing I want to note here about this verse before we move on, is that that he says he wants to show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. Now, Jonathan was David's best friend. He also happened to be the son of the former king, Saul. And Jonathan and David had made this this covenant, this solemn agreement that, that basically said, you know, David committed that even after I have victory over all my enemies, I'm still going to show kindness to any descendants from King Saul, any descendants of Jonathan. So in verse 2 here, we find out that there is uh, the servant of the house of Saul, whose name is Ziba, and they called him to David, and he said to the king, or or the king said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And so David asked the question again, verse 3, is there, any, is there not yet anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of, of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet. Now two things I want to note here. One is that, is that notice now David kind of reconfigures the motivation here a little bit. Not that he's not still committed to keeping his covenant with Jonathan, but now he's talking about showing the kindness of God. David sees, sees this opportunity as expressing the very character of the one that he belongs to, the God of the universe. And notice Ziba's response. There's, yeah, there's this one person, but he's crippled in both feet. Of all the things that he could say about this individual, he mentions that he cannot walk. He is disabled. It's as if if he's going out of his way to say, David, this this guy is not a threat. You don't need to worry about it. He's not going to rise up and try to subvert your kingdom. So you can let him be. Well, in verse 4, the king said to him, where is he? Uh Uh-oh. And Ziba said to the king, behold, he is in the house of Makur, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. 
So David wants to know where this guy is, and he finds out that he's in a place called Lodabar, which may not mean anything to us, but that word literally means nowhereville, nowhere town. It's, it's as if this, that, that Ziba is just going out of his way to say, David, he's not a threat. He cannot walk. He lives on the edge of civilization, far from you in Jerusalem, the seat of power. He's not going to hurt you, so you can let him be. Well, in verse 5, it says, Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Makur, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. And so David wants to see this individual. Notice that he's still unnamed. We're five verses in, and, and, and the author still has not named this, this individual. It's like he's going out of his way to emphasize his obscurity, his outsider status. But just put yourself in his shoes for a moment. He's virtually his whole life he's been trying to keep a low profile, on the down low, not call attention to himself, because he knows what I just finished explaining, that people from the previous regime usually get this. And now he's been exposed. And as he travels to Jerusalem from Nowhereville, I can only imagine how he's wondering, is this my final journey? Are these my last days? Verse 6, we finally learn his name. It's Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and prostrated himself before David. He's on his face. And, he's, and, he's, and, David, and he hears David say, Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth responds and he says, I am your servant. And I can only imagine what's going on in Mephibosheth's mind, his heart racing, wondering to himself, are these my final moments? How is my end going to come? Is it going to be uh, an axe to the neck or a sword to the stomach? How is it going to end? And what Mephibosheth heard next, it must have been as shocking to him as it should be to us. Let's take a look at verse 7. See what happens in the story here. David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of your grandfather, Saul, and you shall eat at my table regularly. Mephibosheth should have been a goner, but instead, David says, I'm going to restore all the land that belonged to your grandpa, and the grandpa was the king, and so the amount of land he had must have been substantial. And not only that, but uh, you're going to eat at my table regularly. Did you catch it? In a moment, the outsider becomes an insider and gets to sit at the king's table. Verse 6, Mephibosheth, he's on the ground again, prostrated himself and said, What is your servant that you should regard a dead dog like me? He can't believe it, and we shouldn't be able to either. David just kind of swats that question away and proceeds with the implementation of what he has just decreed. Verses 9 and 10. Then the king called Saul's servant Ziba and said to him, All that, is bel that belong to Saul and to all, all his house I have given to your master's grandson. You and your sons and your servants shall cultivate the land for him, and you shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food. Nevertheless, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall eat at my table regularly. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And so notice what David says here. Mephibosheth, he gets all land. Mephibosheth, he gets a small army of servants to cultivate the land. Mephibosheth, he gets all the produce that comes from the land. And yet, it's really irrelevant in a way, isn't it? Because Mephibosheth sits at the king's table as one of the king's sons. So who cares about the land in one respect? Because he has over the top what he would need by being at the table. Did you catch it? The outsider has become an insider. The orphan has become a beloved son in a snap. Well, verse 11 recounts Ziba assuring King David that he's going to do what, what the king had had commanded him to do. And then notice the end of verse 11. 
So Mephibosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's sons. It's the third time that phrase has been found in, in this passage, and it won't be the last. In verse 12, we discover that Mephibosheth actually has a son of, son of his own named Micah, and uh, all who lived in the house of Ziba were servants to Mephibosheth. And then the story wraps up in verse 13. Mephib- so Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate at the king's table regularly. Now he was lame in both feet. So we come to the end of the story, and we find that actually nothing has changed about Mephibosheth's disability. He still can't walk. But everything else has changed. Everything else has changed. This is a powerful, powerful story. And it becomes even more powerful when we realize that it's actually a part of a bigger story that's been going on since the dawn of creation. It's a story that, or dawn of humanity, I should say, that, that at the dawn of humanity, our original ancestors decided, well, we don't need God. We can make life work on our own. We, we know better. We can figure it out. And as a result of that, they, and we, by the way, deserved eternal outsider status. And yet, God in his undeserved kindness said, no, this is not the way the story is going to end. I'm going to do something about this. And so this story that began in a garden finds its climax on a hill outside Jerusalem about a thousand years after the story that we just finished reading, not far from where Mephibosheth actually ate at the king's table. And at the climax of the story, an actual descendant of King David, his name was Jesus, the Messiah. He hung on a Roman cross, experiencing ultimate outsider status, taking the the sin of the world upon his shoulders. And not only that, but three days later, returning from the grave to prove that he had power over sin and death and to make it possible for outsiders like us and orphans like us to become beloved sons and daughters to become true insiders. Yes, amen. It's a beautiful story. It's a beautiful story. And um, what I want you to catch here, if you haven't already, is that Mephibosheth experiencing the welcome of David is a picture of us having the chance to receive the welcome of Jesus Christ. And flowing from both of those invitations, I think God has a few invitations for us to consider this morning. And the first one is this. It's to take your place in the story. It's to take your place in the story. And what I want you to catch here is that you and I, we are the true Mephibosheth. Just as Mephibosheth could not get to the king's table on his own because he was disabled, so it is with us. Sin disables us. Our, our, our hard wiring that says, I'm going to live my life instead of the way, life that God wants me to live, that disables us and it keeps us from entering into God's presence, certainly through anything that we do, our religiousness, our morality, being here at North Point this morning, whatever it is that's on your religious resume, it doesn't count for anything because we need Jesus actually to carry us into the King's presence, to provide us with the forgiveness through his his perfect life lived on our behalf through his sacrificial death offered for us. That's what we need to come into the presence of the king. And so if you're here this morning and perhaps in your spiritual journey with God, you've never, you've never come to that point in your life where you said yes to Jesus, may I invite you to do that this morning? You could express something to God like this. You could say, Lord Jesus, I say yes to you. I receive your forgiveness for my sins and and thank you for making me a, a beloved son, a beloved daughter, for making me an insider instead of an outsider as I give my life to you. Second invitation I'd invite us to consider is to play the part, is to play the part. And what I mean by that is that if you have said yes to Jesus at some point in your life, you're, you're, a, you're a son of God, you're a daughter of God. John chapter 1, verse, verse 12 uh, says, As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. 
And so if we have said yes to Jesus, we are true insiders, true sons and daughters. Now, here's one of the many things that that does for us, if we take it to heart, is that it puts in perspective the, either the acceptance or the lack of acceptance that we experience from any other relationship that we happen to be in. And what I mean by that is that if we have, if we have insider status, if we have the, the, the place of being God's beloved son or daughter, let's say that maybe your boss or your professor or your teacher or your parent or your child doesn't think the most of you. Well, that hurts, of course, but it's not the end of the world because, because the God of the universe, the most significant person in the universe, delights in you as, your, as a beloved son or daughter. And that is transformative. I've experienced that in my own life. I, I feel like there have been times in my upbringing where I felt like, like I have this outsider status in my very own family, and that's been painful and continues to be even as someone as old as I am. And yet, the, as I've grown in a relationship with God and as I've grown in a relationship with his people, I've experienced a source of comfort in the midst of that because of the truth that we're talking about here. Well, the third invitation I want to highlight for us before we wrap up is to extend the welcome of the king. Is to extend the welcome of the king. You see, just as King David welcomed Mephibosheth, just as Jesus welcomes us, that's, that's our opportunity as, as followers of Christ, is to welcome the people in our lives. And not just anybody, but especially those that maybe have outsider status compared to us, or especially those with whom we maybe don't see things eye to eye. I mean, think about Jesus. He was always welcoming outsiders, those in the margins, to sit at the table with him. He was always welcoming people that he disagreed with to take a seat at the table with him. And that should mark our lives as his followers. It should mark our life as a church that seeks to uh, be Christ to our community. And, and concretely, we can do that by explaining the good news about Jesus, this message that we've been talking about this morning, to the people in our lives, especially those that are maybe in that outsider place. And we can also do that by, by extending God's kindness to them in practical, tangible ways. And so here's an invitation for you. Just think, for your, think to yourself, even right now, about someone in your life that maybe you'd put in that outsider category. Maybe it's a family member or a friend or a coworker or a fellow student. Who might that person be? And just to give you some additional categories to consider, perhaps it's someone that you don't see things eye to eye with in terms of topics about God or spirituality. Maybe it's somebody that you don't see eye to eye with as far as your politics. Maybe they have a different, a different uh, you know, sign in their front yard in terms of the mayoral election that I notice has been going on here. Uh, or maybe it's, maybe it's somebody who sees things differently than you do. You know, the pandemic, remember that? And how some of us were like really into masks and others of us wouldn't put one on for, for the life of us or the death of us. Uh, maybe it's someone who's on the opposite side of a topic like that. Or maybe it's just somebody who just has a different interest than, than, than you do and you just can't really relate. But what could you do this week with God's help to extend the welcome of the king to that individual? I'll leave you with that to, to consider that possibility. Well, as I mentioned, I've, I've felt there have been times where I've had that just sense of outsider status, in, even in my own family. And what really has made the difference for me, um, as much as anything else, was actually becoming a part of a whole new family. That's what happened about 30 years ago when I married Missy. And just to give you a picture of that, uh, I'll talk to you for a moment about my mother-in-law, who is affectionately known by, as Gunga by everyone in the family. And you would never meet a more welcoming, loving, kind person than Gunga. I think about so many times over the holidays, we would come home from Indiana, where we lived at the time, and we would show up to 
the, the, the front door, and we would always see the, the front storm door, the glass storm door, closed, but then the, the door behind it just swung open as she anticipated our, our coming to welcome us. And as I, as I would walk into the house, it was so uh, common for me just to smell baked goods. Uh, she made a macaroon cake and put it in this lovely cake jar, whatever you call it, cake pedestal, uh, just for me and for the rest of the family as well. Um, it, was just, it was just amazing. And, and, and even when Ganga was on her, on her final days and she began to express her, her verbal desires about what would go to who, uh, she, she wanted to make sure that Bill got his chairs. They were these two green and yellow plaid chairs that I always sat in when I was, was at her house, and she wanted to make sure that they, that they went to me. And so if you came to our house in Orlando, you'd find them uh, sitting, in our, sitting in our front room. And that's just ganga. That's not even to speak of my father-in-law, Missy's dad, or my, my brothers and, and sisters-in-law, or my nephews and nieces. I can't tell you what it's been like over the past 30 years to become a part of a whole new family, to be an insider, to be a part of that. And so, going back to the original question, if we feel like outsiders, is there any hope of becoming an insider? And yes, there is. It's a hope that is, that is anchored in the the love and the welcome of Jesus himself. It's a hope that is over the top in its kindness and its welcome. It's a hope that places us into a whole new family. And so the question again, if, if we feel like outsiders, is there any hope of becoming insiders? Well, I would say this, that because of Jesus' welcome, outsiders can become insiders and invite others to do the same. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your good news that is embodied in the story of King David and Mephibosheth, that we deserve, we deserve eternal outsider status. We deserve to be condemned and rejected and judged because we've rebelled against you. We all have. There's no exceptions. And yet, Jesus, in your kindness, you came after us. You pursued us with your love. You have been over the top in your welcome and your kindness to, to us. Lord, may we say yes to that if there's anyone here that hasn't taken that step yet. And for those of us that have, Lord, would you just, would you just bring that truth way down deep into our hearts? Let it change the way that we uh, experience all of our other relationships even when we don't have the acceptance that we would wish for in them and Lord would you work through us to extend the kindness of the king in a way that would that would just mystify the world around us because people that see things differently about God or politics or social topics or or even basic interests would would be connected and and experience kindness together because of your welcome. Lord, all these things are impossible unless you fill us with your spirit, unless you show up in our lives. And so we invite you to do that in a way that only you can. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.